We're considering functional subject to various constraints. We've looked at integral constraints. Now we're going to look at algebraic and differential constraints. So here's the basic idea. So we have a functional i of, say, two dependent variables, u and v. The integrand f is a function of x, u, v, and u prime and v prime for now. So we have two dependent variables. But there's a constraint in the form of a relationship between those two dependent variables. It could be an algebraic constraint where some function of u and v is equal to zero, or a differential constraint where we have u, v, and some of its derivatives being related to one another. So this would be a differential equation in this case. Now the algebraic constraint, as you can see, is just a differential constraint where there's no derivatives. So they're really just one case, but we can think of them as two separate scenarios, but we'll treat them the same way. So remember, integral constraints are global constraints because they're definite integrals over the entire domain. So it's one constraint on some aspect of the entire solution, whereas algebraic and differential constraints are local constraints. They're constraints on the relationship between u and v at every point throughout the domain. So because we imagine our algebraic or differential constraint as applying locally at every point in the domain, you in fact need a Lagrange multiplier for every point in the domain. So the way we accomplish that is by having our Lagrange multiplier, capital lambda, be a function of x or whatever the independent variable or variables happens to be. So now we have our Lagrange multiplier as a function of x. We have our phi of u, v, or phi of u, v, u prime, v prime is equal to zero, so that's some differential equation. We get our augmented integrand by multiplying the differential constraint by the Lagrange multiplier, which is now a function of x, integrating over the domain. So then our augmented integrand, f tilde, is now the integrand of the original functional, capital F, plus lambda, which is now a function of x, times the differential constraint, phi. So how we get to this point right here, the augmented integrand, is slightly different. But from now on, it's essentially the same, but just taking into account the fact that lambda is now a function of x. And you'll see how that comes in. So if you're interested in the details, you can look in the book. I'm not going to go through them here in the video. It's not terribly important. Instead, I think it's more helpful to do an example. So let's say we have a functional i of two dependent variables, u and v, of this form. So x goes from 0 to 1, and the integrand is 1 half times u prime squared plus v prime squared plus u times v. However, it's subject to the differential constraint that v prime minus u is equal to zero. So that's a differential equation that requires there to be a particular relationship between the u and the v. In this case, we'll have two boundary conditions on u and v at both ends, so all the boundary conditions are specified and known. We form the augmented integrand, the f tilde. It's capital F plus lambda, now as a function of x, the independent variable, times v, the differential constraint. So here is the original capital F plus lambda, the Lagrange multiplier, times phi, the differential constraint. So let's take a look at our integrand as we always do. So we have u's and u primes, as well as v's and v primes. So we write down the Euler equations for that particular situation, and it's our usual form, but now again for f tilde. So then we evaluate the partial f tilde, partial u, partial f tilde, partial u prime, partial f tilde, partial v, and partial f tilde partial v prime. We substitute those in and we get our two Euler equations. So here's partial f tilde partial u and here's partial f tilde partial u prime, partial f tilde partial v, and partial f tilde partial v prime. We take the derivatives, simplify, take the derivative, and simplify, and we have two coupled Euler equations, as we would expect, that involve both u and v, as well as lambda. Now let's come back to this lambda, could because you may have thought, well, we don't know lambda, which is true, so therefore it varies, which is true, and now that it's a function of x, shouldn't we get an Euler equation for lambda as a function of x? And in fact, we do. So if you write down the Euler equation for lambda, it turns out that it just gives you back your differential constraint. So it is true that when you take the variation of your functional, set it equal to zero, you will get a third Euler equation from this process because of the fact that lambda is a function of x and it varies. 
However, that will in fact be the differential constraint that we already have. So it's redundant, it doesn't give us any new information. So the way we'll think about it is we have three differential equations, 291, which is our differential constraint, as well as our two Euler equations that we have right here, one, two. So three differential equations for u, v, and lambda, all three of which are functions of x. So we need to solve these three coupled equations. Now this is problem dependent. Every problem is going to be a little bit different. Usually what we'd like to do is first eliminate the lambda because we often actually don't care about the lambda. We're trying to solve for u and v. The lambda is just this Lagrange multiplier. It's a construct that we introduce to enforce the constraint, but we actually don't care what lambda is. Now in some problems we do, as we'll see in later chapters, but for now we really don't. So the first thing to do is to think about how could we eliminate lambda. So we could differentiate 293 and substitute that into 294. So the first of our Euler equations, differentiate that with respect to x, and then substitute that into the second of our Euler equations, and we would get this expression here. u triple prime minus v prime is equal to v double prime minus u. Now that still involves u and v, but we have eliminated the lambda. Now from the constraint, which we haven't used yet, we have that v prime is equal to u. Well, if that's true, then v double prime is equal to u prime. I can substitute these in here and here to eliminate the v's, and we just get a differential equation for u. All right, so again, three equations for three unknown functions. First, try to eliminate the Lagrange multiplier, and then try to eliminate one of the two dependent variables. In this case, we eliminated v, and we get a third order differential equation for u. So this is the solution for u, and once we have the solution for v, we can use the constraint, which says that v prime is equal to u, to get v. So just integrate this once, and we get a general expression for v. Now you notice we have four constants, c1, c2, c3, c4. We have four boundary conditions. We apply the four boundary conditions. Here they are. And we get a four by four matrix problem to solve. It's given here for those four constants of integration. You solve it, and you get the solution. Plug those back into here and here, and you get the u of x and v of x that are the stationary functions of this functional, but subject to this differential constraint. Now I have a number of comments uh, to make about this. The first is that obviously you could have more than one constraint. And if you do, you just have a Lagrange multiplier for each of those constraints. So lambda one times the first constraint, lambda two times the second constraint. And just remember that the algebraic and differential constraints require Lagrange multipliers to be functions of all of the independent variables. So if it's multidimensional, they'd be functions of x and y, x, y, and z. Now in some cases, the algebraic or differential constraints may be applied only to the boundaries. If that's the case, then your Lagrange multipliers are only functions of the variables along those boundaries. Now these differential constraints are going to come up all over the place in, in the applications that we're going to deal with in parts two and part three of the book. In particular, in part three, where we're dealing with optimization and control, so that's chapter 10 and on, we're going to often have differential constraints, the differential constraints being the governing equations for the system. So there's something we want to optimize about the system or the process, and to do so, we devise an objective functional or cost functional that expresses that optimization principle, but we want to minimize or maximize that optimization principle based on the constraint that the governing differential equation be satisfied. So that's going to be very common in our optimization and control settings. You'll also see in chapter five some additional examples of algebraic constraints in the context of particle dynamics. So the algebraic constraint will be a constraint on the motion of the objects in our dynamical system, as, you would, as you'll see in chapter five. And for you dynamics geeks out there, remember these terms holonomic and non-holonomic. Holonomic corresponds to algebraic or geometric constraints. So that's a constraint on the locations or angles or whatever the dependent variables represent of the particles in your system. A differential or kinematic constraint is known as a non-holonomic. Those are less common, but they involve derivatives. And so any constraint on the dynamical system that involves the derivatives would be a non-holonomic or differential constraint. Now you can also imagine situations where you would have an inequality constraint. So for example, if you have a rocket engine, so you may want to determine the thrust profile for that rocket to get into orbit, 
but you want to do so to minimize time or minimize fuel but you can't exceed the maximum thrust of the rocket so you can have the thrust be anywhere from between zero and the maximum thrust so that would be an inequality constraint on the thrust and you can deal with that in this context and that's addressed in uh, chapter 10.